So now, here we go. Why is it good for society that businesses engage in their long-term investment projects at a time when interest rates are low? Why is it not just good for them that they invest when interest rates are low? Why is it good for everybody? And the answer is because it coordinates things so wonderfully, just like the ham sandwich coordination. It coordinates things wonderfully for this reason. Because remember, how did interest rates get low in the first place? Because you and I are saving. And when you and I are saving, what are we implicitly doing? We're doing two things implicitly. First, we are saying, I am not going to blow my entire paycheck right this minute. I'm going to defer some of my purchases for the future. Well, when a business engages in long-term production, what is that business engaged in? Production for the future. And here I am going to purchase in the future, so there's kind of a time connection. But secondly, think of what happens if you and I save more. Like, we're, you know what? I'm not going to go out and buy that iPod. I'm not going to buy that new hat. I'm not going to buy whatever. I'm, I'm going to save some of my money. Well, the iPod industry and the hat industry are going to find that fewer people want their things. So they're going to start to contract a little bit. So there'll be fewer iPods produced, fewer hats produced, because you and I are saving more. And so the hat industry isn't going to need as many trucks to ship hats anymore, because there aren't as many hats. And they're not going to need as many other uh, materials in their production process, because they don't need to produce as many. Some of these firms will just shut down entirely. Well, that's also, in effect, good, because when businesses engage in long-term production, where's the stuff to engage in this production going to come from? Mars? No, it's going to come precisely from the fact that we are restricting our consumption of consumer goods. And so those industries are going to have a lot of excess truckers and labor and steel that they're not using anymore. And those things can now be used in the higher order stages of production. So again, we have a smooth production coordination that goes on thanks to the interest rate being allowed to tell businesses now is the time to invest. We're just lousy with resources for you to go use and put together to produce super things for us, so now's the time to do it. That's what the interest rate is telling them. Now, here's where we get to the, the heart of the matter. So we've seen what happens when we bring interest rates down. The result is a harmonious and healthy process of investment in long-term production that yields us more goods in the future because it makes us more physically productive. This is wonderful, great. But suppose there were some sinister force I won't mention any names, but there's a sinister institution that just forces interest rates down just artificially, just, just pushes them down, just like that. Now, we don't need to get into how they do this, but the point is they do it. There's some institution, maybe we'll mention it later, but for now, we don't want to prejudice you. It's just some institution pushes interest rates down artificially. Now, what's the difference here? The difference here is that, well, I suppose we do have a similarity. Businesses look, they see lower interest rates, they say, okay, Time to invest in longer-term projects. They are, they are more profitable than they were before, so now we're going to do them. But here's the difference. In this case, uh, you and I have not uh, reduced our consumption. We have not deferred our purchases for the future. Uh, the consumer goods industries have not contracted. So there's, instead of coordination, there's now a mismatch. So when these firms begin these projects, where are they going to get the resources from? Resources have not been released by the lower order stages of production. So lower and higher order stages, instead of, instead of a smooth flowing of production, a smooth coordination, there's a tug of war between the higher and order stages over resources. And the lower order stages are trying to pull the trucks and the labor and everything back this way, and the higher order stages are trying to pull them up this way, and the lower order stages are going to be able to outbid them for these resources because people are actually wanting to buy these things. We want to consume right now. We have not changed our consumption patterns. And so a lot of these new projects are going to turn out to be unprofitable in the long run, unsustainable. In effect, the economy has become too ambitious for its own good. It is trying to do too much at once. It is trying to engage in X amount of consumption and Y amount of investment at the same time when these things are actually incompatible. When actually at this point in the country's development, we can only engage in, let's say, X minus T consumption and Y minus L investment. We, we, we're trying to do, more, we've bitten off more than we can chew. And so the best way to envision this in your mind is to imagine the, the, uh, the master builder of Mises' great example. Ludwig von Mises in his book Human Action in chapter 20 gives this example of the master builder. And this is such a beautiful illustration of the Austrian business cycle theory because he says, let's suppose you have a master builder. So to make this simple, we imagine an economy consisting of one guy doing one thing. He's building a house. But let's say he's drawn up a blueprint for a house that he doesn't have enough bricks to complete. But let's say he doesn't know this. Let's say the house in his blueprint requires 20% more bricks than he's got. 
But he doesn't know that, so he just goes on building and building and building. And then we have to ask ourselves, is it better for this guy to discover his error sooner or later? Well, obviously, the longer this goes on, the worse it is for him. Because if he figures this out after laying down three bricks, then he turns around, does some calculations, says, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm going to have to go back and cross some things off and take the third floor off and whatever. Well, then he can recover from that. But suppose he's putting the last brick on the house and he looks over and there's nothing there. And let's imagine that this is the whole economy. There are no other bricks by definition. This is the whole economy. What happens then? Well, he's going to have to either pull the whole house down or do major renovations or whatever. But what he will find is that he's been doing the wrong thing. He's been too ambitious. He thought he could build this house. He can only build this house. But the problem is it's, it's uh, wealth consuming and time consuming to convert this house into this one. And so he's going to have to waste time and resources going back to what he should have been doing in the first place. Well, as Mises says, this is in effect what the economy is doing during the boom-bust cycle. It becomes too ambitious. It tries to do more things than it has the physical resources to do. And so we see a boom period, though, because it, for a while, everybody's doing lots of things, and that seems great. But in our example, the boom period is when the builder is building his unbuildable house. And superficially, we can say, hey, isn't that great? The guy's working. But is that great if he's building an unbuildable house? No, obviously, the, the best part of this, oddly enough, and I realize this could be uh, taken out of context, but the best part of this is precisely when he realizes he's got to stop that he's done the wrong thing, he's got to completely revise his whole production process. That's the recession. That's when the economy says, wait a minute, wait a minute, there's an incompatible mix of market forces here. Some things are just going to have to be liquidated and go out of business. We're going to have to start the whole thing over. I mean, if not, if not do a complete control, alt, delete on everything, we're at least going to have to make a lot of changes. That's what the economy is trying to say. Now, my own personal contribution to Austrian business cycle theory, and prepare yourselves for this, you notice that everything I talk about a lot of it uh, involves alcohol, and I don't know why that is. I mean, I'm not actually a drunk. But my contribution is this. Let's suppose we are somehow privy to this guy's activities building this, this house in this imaginary one-person economy. And we all know his project is doomed. Would it help him if we said, you know, gosh, I feel so sorry for this guy. I'm not going to want to be here when he discovers that he's been doing the wrong thing and he's been misled. And so why don't we just get him drunk? And then he'll be so happy building and whistling and whatever that he won't even turn to look. In fact, when he looks at the bricks, you know, like he'll see double and he'll think he's got a whole lot. Well, would that, have made, would that make him better off? I mean, would that help? Obviously, that would make the situation much worse. But that's exactly what happens every single time somebody says, well, let's see, we had really low interest rates and that led to this boom that has come to a bust. So the way to get out of this is to have lower interest rates. That's like saying the way to get out of the predicament of this master builder is just to have him keep doing what he's been doing. Just keep on. And in fact, we have now gotten to the source of our initial question. Why the cluster of error? What is the source of the error? What is the source of all these entrepreneurs making these incorrect decisions? The answer is because the interest rate has been distorted. The interest rate is supposed to coordinate production over time and say we should have this much, much production in this stage and this much in this stage and this much in this stage. That's what coordinates it, makes sure that consumers are getting what they want and production is, is occurring in a time schedule that conforms with consumer desires. All, the whole production structure depends on the interest rate telling the truth. The interest rate is just, it's not just some arbitrary number. We can say, hey, wouldn't it be super if it was zero and then just set it there. I, I wish the world were like that, but it isn't. So it turns out that's the source of the problem. And notice this is not a free market problem. The free market is trying to tell businesses the truth. But instead, businesses are getting all this white noise caused by, and now I'm afraid I must indeed reveal the deep, dark secret, <laughs> caused by, the, by and large, by the central bank of the society, or in our case, the Federal Reserve System. When you interfere with interest rates, you get this problem. And now look at what we had in 2001. 2001, we were just on the ed, end of that dot-com boom. Another totally insane boom that made no sense. Hey, everybody, let's invest in pets.com. Because everybody wants to buy, uh, you know, like a pet collar or dog food or something on the internet, right? So let's all, let's do that. Pets.com, like all, a lot of these uh, companies, was a big buy. Everybody liked the sock puppet, by the way. Consumer reports and all that found that everybody loved the Pets.com sock puppet. Just nobody wanted to go to Pets.com. That was the problem. 
And that was the problem with a lot of these internet companies. So they go bust as a, there's a mild recession around 2000, 99, 2000, 2001. And so the chairman of the Federal Reserve System at that time, Alan Greenspan, more or less, if I may quote Homer Simpson, said, uh, it's time to laugh again. And so when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. The hammer of the Federal Reserve chairman is lowering interest rates. Let's lower them further. And so sure enough, what happened in 2001? The recession was very mild. We got out of it very quickly. And people began to say, wow, this guy is like some super genius. And man, Greenspan milked this for all it was worth. He cultivated this image of him, of himself, as, as somebody who sat there in, in the tub, poring over statistics, and just sitting there and just gazing at statistics, waiting for things to jump out at him. And in fact, you know, one time he, he was even saying that he decided to make a quarter uh, point drop in the interest rate because he just literally was a pain in his stomach. And it, and it told him that this, and, and people were going for this. Well, you know, Greenspan's kind of queasy. I think rates need to come down. And it got to the point where people got so caught up in this that there was even an article in the New Republic magazine, a, a, a magazine I hope you never read. But in the New Republic, there was, a, there, was, there was a journalist named Stephen Glass who wrote an article about, now Stephen Glass, remember what the, the distinguishing feature of Stephen Glass is? All his stories are made up. They, they found out later that the reason no other reporters broke any of these stories is that none of them existed. And other reporters were just so envious of this guy. How does he find all these stories? And other editors are going, why can't you be like Stephen Glass? Turns out he just made all the stories up. You could come up with some awesome stories that way. And they actually made a movie about this guy called Shattered Glass. It's worth seeing. Anyway, so he, he wrote this story saying that people so loved Alan Greenspan that a group of Wall Street guys had built a little shrine to Greenspan with his picture and some flowers and candles, and they would all sit around and meditate in front of him. So he passes off this story, and, and people, nobody, notice, nobody notices that this is a phony story. People read that story and say, yeah, I think that seems like something somebody might do, sure. I mean, this is, what has happened to the dignity of the people? that they fall for such crude superstition like this because of the head of the monetary authority. So indeed, all, all Greenspan was doing was just getting the patient sicker. All he was doing was getting the master builder drunk. So that now, when the bust inevitably does come, I mean, the master builder in our example, inevitably the bust is coming. Eventually, he's going to have to stop. But it's going to be worse when it comes because in the interim, he's been doing the wrong thing all that time. So now, yeah, okay, we didn't have the, anything particularly bad in 2001, and now we have now. Well, thanks a lot. And then meanwhile, Greenspan uh, testifies before Congress and says, you know, I just wish I could understand why the free market is so volatile. <laughs> yeah, I wish I could there, Alan. I guess, I guess we'll just never figure that one out. It's a big whodunit. And everybody goes around saying, well, look, I mean, even Alan Greenspan says we need to regulate this economy, and we know he's a big free market guy. No, he's a big monetary central planner. That's not, that's not the free market. All right, so what we had, though, at the time in 2001 were the experts all being trotted out to tell us that why this was just the thing to do. Lower interest rates. Lower interest rates even lower. That's just what we needed. Let's continue the economy on this unsustainable production trajectory. That ought to do it. And here we've got um, Paul Krugman, who uh, writes for the New York Times, who said, in 2001, we need lower interest rates because, among other things, they will stimulate spending on housing. Well, isn't it interesting that in 2001, that was the first recession ever on record in which housing starts rose rather than fell, and house prices rose. And so what conclusion did people naturally draw? Here it was a recession, and yet housing is still robust. So people said, well, I guess that goes to show housing is good through thick and thin. House prices never fall, even in a recession. I bet the best investment I could make would be in some investment properties. So this fuels this crazy mania. So people are getting the cause and effect reverse. A lot of people think, well, suddenly there's just a mania for no reason. You know, it's not that there's a mania for no reason. It's that people actually observe actual phenomena and then, yes, indeed, sometimes they get psychologically carried away, but the phenomena come first, and they were caused precisely by this non-market institution, the Federal Reserve. Okay, now, I'm going to skip just in the interest of time. Now,